I'm very happy to be here in San Marino today. This is where I was born and I grew up, and I have lots of memories about my childhood. When I was a kid, I used to spend my afternoons around here uh, at my grandparents' house. And uh, what I would do after school oftentimes was ending up watching TV. So I have these memories of uh, many cartoons and TV series at that time, fantasizing about how future technology would help us in the future. For example, there were friendly assistant robots like uh, Rosie in the Jetsons or Vicky in Small Wonder. They are helpful housekeepers, able to do practically every house chore and often imitating directly from their um, owners. Another very popular TV series at the time was Knight Rider starring Kit, a highly advanced AI-powered self-driving car. Look at what happens the first time that Michael Knight, the main character, finds out about Kit's gadgets. All right, might as well put on some music. All these weird gadgets, you think they'd give you a radio? What would you like to hear? What the hell was that? Do you wish further information on Silicon Valley? Hell no, I want to know who you are and how you're listening in. A talking car at that time was science fiction, but Kit resembles a lot of the voice assistants that we use today. A main feature of Kit was also the ability to drive by itself, to meet Michael whenever he needed it. This is also something we are trying to develop today with autonomous driving. The goal of self-driving cars is not only to lift us from the burden of driving, but also to make transportation safer by reducing the number of car accidents. To achieve this, they need to withstand practically any road and weather conditions and be better than humans at driving. They have to understand the surroundings and localize the presence of pedestrians and cars so to safely plan the trajectory. They need to be so smart that they can even anticipate the maneuver from another driver or a pedestrian trying to cross the road from behind another car. We're also developing intelligence assistance personal robots that can help us at home, like Rosie and Vicky, performing tasks that we do not often want to do, such as unloading the dishwasher, clean our living room, or do our dishes. But even tasks that we can not do, that we are unable to do. A new generation of assistive robots to, designed to help elderly people and people with disability with daily tasks such as measuring your blood pressure or video call your relatives. But how hard is to make these machines smart enough to accomplish all these goals? It turns out that making a machine intelligent is actually quite hard. Imagine a scenario where I ask my robotic assistant that we will picture as Wally in our example, to go pick up my mug by saying, I think I left it in the living room. It's the one with the big F on top. So the robot goes to the living room, looks around, and its robotic eyes pick up this image. To accomplish this task, pick up my mug, the robot needs to first recognize my mug among the others. But how do we build up a robot that recognizes objects in our homes or a car that drives better than a human? A computer is a calculator, and it's really good at computing formulas. If I want to know the time of the next solar eclipse, I can simply input a few physics equations, the current position of the Earth, Moon, and Sun, press a button, and the computer will precisely predict when the eclipse is going to happen. With our example of the max, the computer will instead have a hard time to solve the task, since there's no mathematical equation that, given an image, can tell the difference between a mug and any other object in the world. Instead of applying a set of rules of operations, to solve this task, the computer needs to learn a concept, such as the concept of max and what makes it unique with respect to any other object. But how can a computer learn a concept or even become intelligent? As we would do with a baby, we need to teach them. We train a computer by giving it examples, which means we take many pictures of mugs and then also pictures of other objects that look like mugs, and we, ass we assign each of them to the right category so the computer can distinguish among them and learn to generalize when a new mug will appear. This is the so-called supervised learning, where we act as teachers or supervisors. These learning techniques are studied and developed by an important branch of artificial intelligence known as machine learning. 
The goal of machine learning is to make machines learn concepts from data in order to perform a task without being given a set of explicit rules. For us, the ability to learn and generalize is what makes a machine intelligent. To develop intelligent techniques for machines, machine learning has taken inspiration from our own brain. This is a neuron. Our brain has around 100 billions of them. They're connected together by forming neural networks. In our visual system, they process the images acquired from our eyes by passing signals from one neuron to the other allowing us to recognize objects, identify people, or perform actions. Since neurons are functionally so simple, but yet so powerful, computer scientists have tried for more than 60 years to create an artificial model of them. That means turning a neuron into a mathematical function or a model that can be programmed inside a computer. The goal is to connect these artificial neurons together to create the so-called artificial neural network, which are now an important part of machine learning. Arguably, the first technique using artificial neurons is the so-called perceptron. Developed by Frank Rosenblatt in 1957, this algorithm was designed to recognize objects from images that, given the technology of the time, were 10,000 times smaller than those that we can get today from our smartphones. Still, to process this tiny image with artificial neurons, the machine occupi occupied a large space in a room and was quite complicated, as Rosenblatt himself shows in this picture. People were already very optimistic about this technology. Reportedly, it was able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence, or this is what it was expected to be. For the first time, the general opinion around AI started to worry due to the idea of a computer that can learn on its own without the need of being programmed. But just a few years later, Minsk and Paper, two of the fathers of AI, published a book called Perceptrons, demonstrating all the limits of this technology, in particular showing that the perception was unable to solve even very, very simple problems. This led to a great disappointment known as the first AI winter. There have been several springs and winters in AI, each time fostered by a new exciting finding, followed by some big hype and inflated expectations like AI will solve everything or AI will kill us all. And sometimes later, the disillusion due to the emerged limitations. The last winter happened in the 90s. At that time, neural networks could only solve very, very simple tasks. So scientists wanted to combine small neural networks together in order to create a bigger one that could be capable of performing more complex tasks. But there were two problems. First of all, computers that, at that time were generally not sufficiently powerful to run these big networks. And second, these bigger networks turned out not to be better than the smaller ones. In the early 2000s, computer scientists found new, very effective ways for artificial neurons to be combined together and to learn from big amounts of data. Also, the new computers started to be powerful enough to run them. The learning ability of these new models, called deep learning, improved so much that they were able to even be better than humans at certain tasks, such as classifying images or playing Go. Deep learning can now perform amazing tasks, and it's really good at synthesizing images and videos in a very realistic way. It can, for example, generate realistic faces of people that do not exist by learning from a data set of real Hollywood actors, as shown in this research work from NVIDIA. All these faces are people that were synthetically created via deep learning. We can create a synthetic video of Obama repeating the speech from the words of a voice impressionist. When you uh, giving a speech, uh, make sure you use uh, a lot of pauses and speak uh, in a very weird timbre. Or show how it would look like if you were older or younger. It can also be applied on language. We can now feed a neural network with old books from Shakespeare and it will learn to write a completely new story using its style, like this one. So let's go back to our personal robot trying to pick up my mug. 
Well, he has now learned to recognize my mug, but this is not enough. He still needs to estimate the distance of the mug in the 3D space so that he can reach out with his robotics arm and pick it up. And without a precise knowledge of the distance of the mug from itself, it cannot basically accomplish its task. This is because a robot or a self-driving car is an intelligent machine which is not just a computer but also as a body. And with this body, it interacts with the environment. To accomplish their tasks, intelligent robots and cars need to relate themselves to the surrounding world and know their precise position with respect to the objects around. For this, they are equipped with vision sensors such as cameras that act as their eyes, and then they need a brain that can process the images acquired from the cameras to move from the 2D world to the 3D world. Once this brain lets them understand the 3D geometry of the scene, the location and shape of the objects in front, they can finally move and pick up our mark. The technology that processes the data acquired from the eyes of the robots and cars and gives them the spatial and semantic awareness is another branch of artificial intelligence known as 3D computer vision. Together, deep learning and 3D computer vision are making cars and robots intelligent. With our team at the Technical University of Munich, we were among the first to investigate the use of deep learning and 3D computer vision, focusing especially on very cheap and off-the-shelf hardware. Here we propose the use of deep learning to reconstruct a 3D scene from a simple mobile device such as a smartphone. Thanks to this, robots can reconstruct the 3D map of a room while going around to understand the environments and its different semantic parts. And all this just by using a simple webcam as eyes. 3D computer vision and deep learning are useful not only for cars and robots. We've been working on a mobile app designed to help visually impaired people by understanding the geometric and semantic information of a room inferred via 3D computer vision. We process the data acquired from the camera of a smartphone to understand the surrounding environment and its different parts. Thanks to this, the computer can create informative sentences that are then read out to the users in order to help them to safely move around the room and perform actions such as sitting on a chair or using objects on a table. There is a door on your left in 2.7 meters. There is a chair in front of you in 1.6 meters. We dub this concept 3D captioning. We have seen how deep learning can perform difficult tasks by learning from lots of supervised examples. But this capability is also one of its main limitations. To collect new data, we need our teacher to assign each new image the right category. And this is a costly and time-consuming process. Just imagine doing this for all the images in the world. So to overcome this limit, a promising direction is the development of techniques where the network can learn without a teacher, without supervision. First, we provide the computer some initial examples and the associated category. Then, the computer continues to learn by itself from the newly collected examples. If it's confident about a new example, it can add the category by itself and improve its learning skills. Otherwise, if it's unsure, it can simply discard it. We are developing novel techniques where machine learning, once bootstrap, can improve its prediction performance and refine its internal model in this so-called self-supervised learning. With self-supervised learning, we can estimate the 3D geometry of the road and its components from the images acquired from a camera on board a car while the car is driving. Our deep learning model continuously uses this image to refine its internal model and its reconstruction skills. And with a more accurate and more up-to-date 3D model of the surroundings, the car can better and especially more safely drive around. 3D computer vision aided by deep learning can lead to a new generation of AI that can really help humans perform the most delicate, most dangerous, and most difficult tasks, such as identifying pathologies in medical data, forcing the intention of a kid to cross the road, or localizing a hidden exploding device without the need for humans to be nearby. The path will be long, and many more winters are coming. We have to be aware that throughout the springs and winters, 
AI has always been very susceptible to inflated estimates, hype, fear, and disillusions. To be successful in innovating the industry with new products, improving our daily lives, and accomplishing our technological dreams, we need to be aware of the ongoing hype of the topic and of its limitations. Vicky and Rosie won't be happening tomorrow, but if we understand what works already and learn from what doesn't work yet, we can take the best of 3D computer vision today while making the next steps towards the future of AI. Thank you.